Okay, welcome. So, my name's Nick Birch. I'm CTO at a company called Quanticate, headquartered in the UK, what's called a clinical research organization, help companies with clinical trials. And we're a lot smaller than most of our main competitors. So the way that we maintain our edge is by using a lot of open source data. Just trying to move the microphone up a bit. Oh, except now I won't go back on my shirt. This is... is that any better? Or is that worse? <laughs> okay, so um, I've been involved in Apache Tika for um, ooh, probably about four or five years now. Um, I originally got involved in Apache Tika because I was working for a company called Alfresco which was maintaining its own small set of text extraction and metadata extraction um, code base. And I managed to persuade them to merge that into uh, Apache Tika and Apache Poi. If you're interested in any of that in the history, I gave a talk on Monday morning for which the slides are available, or I go into that in a bit more depth. Whereas what we're going to look at today, a little bit about the basics of Apache Tika. We're going to have a look at detection ways that we can work out what this pile of ones and zeros are, the, the binary data, the text data. We'll look at ways that you can extend Tika to handle new formats, especially if you run your detection from Apache Tika against an entire big data cluster worth of things and discover that not all of the file formats that you've come across are actually supported out of the box in Tika. We'll look at some of the ways of running Tika, some of the advantages and disadvantages of them. And then we'll see how that all comes together a little bit on some big data scale. And then finally, I'll mention a couple of Apache projects and non-Apache projects that could be relevant. And I'm hoping that a few people from the audience will have some other ideas too. So Tika in a nutshell. Um, we like to call it the Babelfish of content. Those of you who know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy know about the Babelfish small, yellow, leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. So, Tika will help you work out what sort of thing your content is. That bunch of ones and zeros is a Word document. That bunch there is a text document. It'll help you get the metadata out of a document in a consistent way. It'll help you get the plain text out, which would be of interest to you who want to do indexing, full text indexing things and it provides a rich XHTML version if you want to see the content and the structure and how it all fits together. Some of the uh, supported formats in Tika out of the box. We've got the HTML, XHTML, XML kind of family. We've got all of the Microsoft Office file formats, uh, open document formats for OpenOffice, iWorks, and then PDF, RTF, all those other text ones. We support most of the main compression and archive formats. Uh, we do Atom, RSS, EPUB, that kind of thing. We've got a fair number of audio formats that we are able to get meaningful metadata out of, such as MP3, MP4, and the, the Vorbis and Old family. And then we can get all sorts of metadata out of image formats. Right. That's a kind of high-level summary of what we can give you loads and loads of detail on. So basics, how does this all work? One of the things Tika does, as I've said, is detection. And it'll, that'll let you work out what kind of file something is. Um, and we can use a number of different techniques, which I'll go into in more detail later. Basically, we can use the file name. We can look at the first few hundred bytes of the file and look for certain magic numbers and magic byte patterns. Um, for some of the formats, we've got dedicated Java code that actually runs and opens up the file and, and looks inside it and makes sense of it that way. And normally what will happen is you'll use a combination of all of them. For example, you can use MindMagic to work out roughly what file it is, and then you can look at the file name and say, ah, well, it's probably this specialization of that format, so the chances are it's, it's going to be one of those. You can use it standalone and just say, Tika, that one megabyte thing there, what the hell is it? Or you can use it with the parsers where you go, Tika, work out what that is, work out how the hell to parse it, parse it, and tell me what the title and the author is. 
So you can choose to do one or just throw it all in and say, work it out for me and do some magic and, and tell me later. So metadata, describing the file. Title, the author, your creation date, the location that the document or the scientific file came from. Uh, and Tika provides a way to extract that where it's present. And Tika tries to provide a consistent way to extract that. So maybe it's called author, maybe it's called creator, maybe it's called created by, maybe it's first author, maybe it's index zero into the creator list, depending on the file format. If you're trying to make sense of this, you probably don't want to have to go and get out the PDF spec and look up and work out what that one is and then go and compare it to the EXIF spec. So with Tika, we try and map it onto consistent, well-known metadata so that you can say, Tika, for that file there, give me the thing that is semantically equivalent to the Dublin core creator. And then Tika will go off, work out what the file type it is, work out what library to use, go and get the metadata from it, map that from whatever the file format happens to call it onto a consistent namespace and say, it was created by Nick. Nice and easy. Plain text, most file formats have at least some text in them. Um, and if it's a plain text file, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of all you've got. You've got no metadata. Um, and there are lots of libraries out there that will let you get plain text out of all these different files but they're all very different and they vary. So what Tika tries to do is hide that from you. Just go to Tika and say, that thing there, plain text, please. Um, so if you're going to be um, indexing, if you've got um, a very large content repository and you want to have that fed into Solar or Elasticsearch or whatever, you can ask Tika to just rip out the plain text, give it back to you, and index that. Or alternatively, we can give XHTML. When I say XHTML, I don't mean Microsoft Word, open document, save as HTML. I'm trying to have a kind of simple, semantically meaningful, simplified form. Um, and actually, if you ask Tika for the plain text, what it does is it uh, gets the, um, the SACS events and just throws away anything that's not actually text. Um, so you can use that for some sort of basic previews. Or another thing that people sometimes do is that they'll take the SACS events and the, the document structure and use that to pick out parts of it. So if you've got a Word document, we will output a block with the heading in, and then we'll output a block with the main body in, and then a final bit with the footer in. So because you've got that SACS structure, you could say, well, I'm actually only interested in the bit from the main body, and then get the plain text from that. But it gives you control over what bits you're, for example, going to index. So, those pesky ones and zeros, what the hell are they? This is one that normally comes up when people ask about that. They're like, oh, it's, it's easy, isn't it? Surely, you know, it's a file on your computer. You must know what that is. Um, okay, well, so it's not a file on your computer. It's a file on someone else's computer or on a, on a network share. Um, but it's, you know, it'll be there. You know, whoever put it there, they won't have done anything naughty to it. Well, okay, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they renamed it. But they wouldn't have renamed it that badly, would they? Um, and it's on the internet. So, you know, things on the internet, that never lies, does it? <laughs> Who's heard of there being something wrong on the internet? But you ask a web server, they, they know what things are, don't they? You know, you've, you've never requested a dot doc and got back a PDF or plain text or error codes and things. And... Even if the internet's mostly right, you know, that's good enough. You know, I mean, how many documents is 3% of the internet? Um, people never rename things by accident, and operating systems never help. And, like, if you use Windows, what happens if you do hello.text.doc? What does that typically look as in the file name? So, in theory, knowing what something is, really simple at a big data scale, or even just an organization-wide scale, and sometimes even on your local machine, we, we can't necessarily just trust. So, file names, how most things start out. Um, normally have extensions, but not always. Trouble is, extensions, three characters, typically. How many combinations does that give us? How many different kinds of files are there in the world? 
And unlike with mime types, there's no official registry. You can't go and claim dot doc just for yourself. So you can very often find lots of different programs that all think their file has a given extension. And um, certain names get reused a lot because they look sensible. So we can try and use file names. And maybe they'll be right in like half the time, three quarters of the time. But if we've got a few million files, that's still going to be a lot of error. My magic, most file formats have a well-known structure for some value of structure, and some value of well-known. Um, so you can get my magic numbers, which is either a number or a hex string or some sort of combination of hex and bytes and masking and things that are normally near the start of the file. And you can say, right, well, if, if the file starts with 0x, f, 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 e, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, then that's probably going to be that file there. And if we find percent PDF dash 1.4 somewhere in the first 150 bytes, then probably that's going to be a PDF. And then what we want to do is also we want to look for this byte string and then ignore the next eight bytes. And then we look at that one, and that'll tell us if it's version A or version B of the file. So you can often get close with those. But it takes a bit of time looking at file format specs and hex dumps and things to work out what they are. And you've got to assume that it's roughly a fixed offset. And some files, you actually only find the magic information at the end, and that's, that's not that great. And um, you get problems with container formats. So um, just got a few examples here for, for magic, for those of you who have not seen it before. PDFs normally start percent PDF dash. Not always. OLE two docs, you know, there's your magic there. Zip files, AIF ones with the, the, the masks in there. And they're not unique. Does a file start with 0x FF FE 20? That could be a UTF 16 little endian text file, or it could be an MP3, which caused a great bug report when we had that one in Tika, and we've had to disable that particular bit of my magic. So problem with my magic is what happens if you find PK34? It's a zip file. But that could be a zip, or it could be an OOXML document, or it could be an ODF document, or it could be a Keynote file, or it could be an EPUB, or it could be something else. So there's lots of file formats that are actually based on well-known containers. So how do we know whether this zip file that we've just detected with the my magic is actually a plain zip or is it a Word document or whatever? And in the case of some of the um, cont uh, video formats and things like that, you could actually find that it's got two video streams and two audio streams and a subtitle stream and, and, and all that sort of thing. So containers get to be a bit awkward. So we can use the my magic to spot the container, but then we actually have to go and unpack the container and look inside it. And so if we say, well, inside this, we've got a zip entry called underscore rels dot rels, then that's probably an OOXML file. And then if we actually unpack the um, special XML file within there, we'll actually find the definition of the mind type of the overall document. That's easy. Or if we've got an OG file, then we can look in the CMML stream and pull it out from that. Or otherwise, if we see it's got certain files present, then we can work out from those what, what the file type actually is. So. It could call itself test.zip, because someone's renamed it, but actually it's a Word document. And the only way you'll find that is by using the my magic to work out it's a zip, unpack the zip, look inside, look at the structure, find the content types XML file, read that out, find the default entry. There we are, we're done. Aren't you glad Tik does that for you? <laughs> so all these different ways out there of detecting it, some of them are really quick but low quality. Some of them are expensive, but will give you an exact answer. So with Tika, you've got a choice. Either you can call out to the specific bits in the detector chain that you're interested in, or you can say, Tika, find me, to the best of your ability, the right thing. So if you go with, a, if you go with the default Tika config object, it'll load in all the available detectors, or you can fetch individual ones and, and call them. And if you use multiple detectors through default detector, Tika will try them in the right order so that you can specialize based on file names and things like that. 
So that was for binary files, which will by bit, sort of by byte, byte volume, be probably mostly what you'll find if you're doing big indexing or big searching and that kind of thing. But in terms of value, the text files are often going to be the, the more valuable things you want to find that tend to be quite small, but you've got to work out what they are. Encodings. Is this new to people? Most people know about this. So you've got characters, and then you've got bytes, and they're not always the same. So if we've got the letter A and we need to write it to a file, we could write that as 0x41. That's ASCII, that's UTF-8, ISO 8859-1, all those things. You could write it as 0x0041 or 0x4100, UCS2 or um, UTF-16, depending on if it's Little Endian or Byte Endian, or it could be 0xc1 if you're writing for an MCDIC IBM mainframe. It's not a single way to represent it. And in the interests of saving space in the past, um, lots of people had one byte per character encodings. But there are more than 256 different characters in the world. So they had different single byte code pages that would encode it a different way. So if we find a file that starts with 0xe1 and we know it's text, well, that could be an accented A, could be an alpha, could be a couple of different Cyrillic things, could be Arabic, could be Hebrew. And that was just from the first six code pages I picked off Wikipedia and looked up in the, in the matrix for. Some formats are helpful and tell you up front what encoding they've used. My important information.txt. Well, from the file name, you can kind of see that it's English and maybe guess from that, but there's, there's no easy way to do it. Languages. It's possible from a plain text file to take a guess at the language that's contained in it because different languages have different patterns of letters based on their words and their spellings. So if you see those accents in a file, there's a reasonable guess that you're not dealing with English text. If you see lots of words starting with the letter S, it's probably not Spanish. If you see lots of words that start ES, then maybe it is Spanish, because Spanish don't like, Spanish language doesn't like the word, the letter S starting in normally prefix it. That's why it's Espana in Spanish. So you can look for those patterns and try and work out what the language is. But you need a lot of text to be able to work on that. If I give you one word, it's very hard for you to use statistical patterns to work out what language it is, unless you had a, a dictionary to look it up in. But if I give you several pages worth of text, you can start seeing these common patterns and maybe working out what that is. Engrams. I know we've got a few solar people in the audience who will nod sagely at these for other people who've not come across them. Who, who knows what an engram is? Okay. So the, the N at the start of the engram is the, the, the length of it. Um, and the reason that we might be interested in this for Tika is because we can find common patterns in text. So the, maybe you can use trigrams or programs. So if we had the word hello, the trigrams of that will be start of word marker H-E, E-L-L, L-L-O, L-O, end of word marker. So if we had a trigram in Spanish, we'd see lots of start of word E-S, but almost no start of word S. So we can use those to identify both the language and the encoding. So if we know what common engrams are in Spanish, as characters, we can then use character mapping tables to translate those into all of the common encoding formats where you would find Spanish. And so maybe the, the N with the, the tilde on the top, the NA, will come in different points in those character tables. But we can then look for that engram pattern in our files and say, aha, I can say that to a reasonable degree of likelihood, this is both Spanish and ISO 889-1 encoded. But we need a huge number of engrams, and we have to already have the, the, the mapping tables and things like that. So how does that all fit into Tika? If Tika recognizes your ones and zeros as text, it will then detect the encoding and pass it. 
and Tika will return you a, a string, a Java string. So it will have done that um, for you. And in the metadata object, you'll get the encoding that Tika detected. Um, you can explicitly detect it using encoding detector. If all you're interested in is what's the encoding, you can grab an encoding detector and find it from that. Or you can say, Tika, here's some ones and zeros. Give me the plain text back. And Tika will go, aha, that's plain text. And it's in 8859-12 uh, encoding. So I know how to turn that back into Java string. And here's your text as a Java string. It's all, all sorted for you. Uh, Tika has a few different encoding detection methods out of the box. And most of the major encodings and most of the major languages are supported. But if you're dealing with unusual for Tika encodings, you may have to go and find a corpus of text, generate some more engrams and that sort of thing and load them into Tika. So Tika's got 30 languages out of the box. There are more than 30 languages in the world. So if you're doing lots of this thing, just have a look at that list and, and see if you need to add some more in. Now, um, the encoding detection only kicks in if Tika thinks it's plain text. There's no point trying to find the encoding of an image, because that doesn't have a text encoding. That's, that's an image. If you've got a load of control characters at the start of your file, Tika will think that this is not, in fact, plain text, so it won't work. Um, so that can be an issue if you've got data corruption, or you've got a mostly text-based format that's got some weird things at the start. Another problem is that some encodings are very similar. Uh, if memory serves ISO 8859-1 and dash 15, diff in only one code point. So unless you happen to have included that one code point, it's going to be very hard for Tika to tell them apart. And the shorter the length of text we've got, the harder it is for us to detect. So if you've got a large document, stand a fair chance. If you've got one sentence, you won't. So if you're testing this, please don't test with a single sentence. I've seen a lot of people come on the mailing list and go, oh, this stuff's crap. I gave it my name and it didn't work it out. It's like, yeah, I've just given it your email and it does. Oh, why is that? Because it's got to have more text to work out what it is. So if you're going to be testing it to work out if it's going to behave for you, please give it a meaningful amount of text. OK, another thing you might be interested in, embedded resources. And that's not just for the containers. So if you've got a zip file, everything in it is an embedded resource. But if you've got an Office document, that can also have embedded resources in it. So you can have an Excel file that embeds a PowerPoint file, that embeds a Word file, that embeds an image and a video. You can sort of chain them together. Um, and if you've got um, most of the Office documents support embedding other Office documents and videos and text and pictures and things. Uh, and if you ask Tika for the structured text, it will, where possible, tell you where in the file that embedded resource came. So that if you are indexing a load of PowerPoint presentations for your company's intranet, or you know, uh, one of the big data repositories, you're probably going to be interested not only in the main PowerPoint document, but also the fact that it's got an image in it, or it's got an embedded Excel file which has got all the labels in. So it starts being important as you're trying to get a lot of information out from that. So, how do you pick what you're interested in and what you're not? For example, if you're indexing for plain text, you probably don't care about all of the images embedded in a Word document. Because unless you've got really good OCR, you're not going to be able to get the text out. But you are going to be interested in, in the text of the embedded Word document in the master Word document, because that's got an entire page that you want to be able to index and find. So when you call Tika, uh, if you give it a, a, a pass context object, you can attach onto that an embedded document extractor. And that will then be called every time Tika finds an embedded resource. And it'll be called on the should pass embedded method. So in there, you can just say, if mime type is plain text or Word or Excel, return true, else return false. And then you'll only be called for those things that you're interested in. And then Tika won't bother extracting all of that data out if you're not going to be interested in it. So you can decide for your given project what's, what's going to be important to you, and then choose which things you recurse into and which things you don't. And then if you've opted in, if you've returned true from should pass embedded, the pass embedded method will be called on your class. 
and you get the stream, you get the content handler, which you can then write the text out to, and the metadata object. And if all you want to do is save that out to a file for later passing or something like that, just stream the input stream to disk and you're done. If you want to process that file, you probably want to get an auto detect parser and give it to that. If you're recursing, you'll create a new pass context. Don't forget to save yourself onto it if you want to keep going down, because you can have a Word document with an Excel with an image in. So each time you trigger a fresh pass, you need to attach yourself on so that it keeps recursing down. If you don't want to go recurse down, don't set it on the inner loops. So how do we extend Tika to handle the interesting file types you found in your office or on the internet? And currently, Tika supports about 1,400 MIME types in terms of detection and information on them. Not all of those have got mind magic. I think it's about a quarter of them. We've got some sort of mind magic or some sort of default extension. The rest of them, we know what it is, but we, we probably can't detect it. But there's a lot more than 1,400 file formats in the world. And if you've got custom ones, then there's, there's no hope for those. Now, if it is a well-known format that we don't know about, your best bet is to report a bug Tell us about the file format. We'll add it for you. Next release, it's all done. If it's your private internal office format, we're probably not going to want to put that in the core one. And if you want something in today, don't want to wait for the release. Um, when Tika's loading the list of MIME types it knows about, it will also check for that file there, custom MIME types.xml. So you can define your own MIME types, have as many of those files as you want on your class path. Tika will load all of them and use them in preference to the built-in ones. And this is our example, hello world, mime type. This one here has no information other than the mime type. And this one here, we've got the comment that you can fetch, some metadata about the mime type. Apparently, this one has a file extension .hello.world, and it will contain the word hello world at the start of it. So we've got the mime magic, we've got the file names, and everything like that. So you can define files in that structure, and Tika will load them, and then it will be able to do the detection based on that. And if you're interested in seeing how it comes together, this is actually taken from one of the Tika unit tests, so you can see how when you load that into the class part, it's then able to detect this made up hello world file type. The other thing you might want to do, if you're getting new file types that Tika doesn't support, um, is to implement a custom parser. Um, and there are two methods that you have to implement. The parse method, which actually passes the file and returns metadata and, and text and stuff. And the get supported types, which is where your parser announces which MIME types it can support, so that then Tika knows which parser to route a particular file to. And the contract for a parser is that you read in the input, giving it to another library if you need to, and output XHTML SAX events for the the text in the file, and you populate the metadata and trigger any recursion. Uh, if you look on the Tika website, you'll see the hello world parser, which is 13 lines. So minimal parser for your new file format can be as short as 13 lines, especially if you've got a handy library that will deal with it. So when you need more control over the parsing than Tika gives you, um, there are a few options available. So, Tika itself tries to map the common metadata onto known standards and provide semantically meaningful non-cluttered non, um, XHTML. But it's not aiming to be picture-perfect XHTML rendition of your file. Um, so the Excel parser will return what's there. It does not return a CSV. The word parser returns tables and style names, but it doesn't mark up every single text character with the font name and the font style and the coloring and the sort of ghastliness that you've got out of office. But it's possible that for your particular use case, you do care about trying to get Tika to produce a CSV or pull out all the font information. So how do you do that? 
well, you create your own custom parser, and then you, um, you register it. And when Tika is looking for a parser for a given mime type, if one of them is in the org Apache Tika namespace and the other one isn't, it preferentially picks the non-Tika one. So you just create a parser, register it for a common mime type, put it on the class path, and Tika will use your parser of preference. Um, I would suggest that you create a service file with that name, org Apache Tika parser, parser, list your class name in, and it will be auto-discovered. Or you can create your own Tika config object or default parser object and give it a subset of parsers. So if you're trying to index the internet, but you're only interested in Word and Excel files, don't have Tika autoload all of them and then throw away the content that comes back from images. Just create a constrained list of parsers for any of the ones you're interested in. And then Tika will only pass those and it'll skip over the other documents. If you need to do your own thing for a particular file type, um, have a look at the uh, Tika parser source code for that particular type. And if you think there's something that ought to be an option, tell us. So if you look at the PDF parser, for example, there's some various booleans you can set on it to control turning on and off certain extraction features. And if you think there's a common use case, let us know. And there's a reasonable chance that we'll put that in, and then you'll be able to control. Um, Tika only uses um, permissively licensed uh, dependency libraries, which doesn't cover all of the possible file types out there. There are various file types for which the Java library is only available under the GPL or the LGPL and so on. So we maintain on the wiki page a list of parsers that can't be included in Tika for licensing reasons, but which you could choose to include if you wanted. So you can have a look at those. Um, and then, um, you know, so you find the Java library that's going to pass it, you write your own parser, maybe extending a bit of the Tika one, register it, and away you go. Okay, how to run Tika. I think this is the complete list of ways to run Tika. We try to be very open. So there's a command line tool. There's a simple Java class you can call that does all the heavy lifting underneath. Or you can call all the individual Java classes yourself. There's no SGI bundle that includes all the dependencies in one go and deals with all that modularity and, and class loading and all that fun. There's a forks parser that will actually set, call a second JVM to run to do the passing in another JVM so that if the parser for some reason breaks and falls over, you haven't wiped out your main JVM. We have a, a JAXRS network server, which provides a RESTful interface, fire it up, post files to it, suck back the result. There's a Solar plugin um, so that you can post your file to Solar and then Solar will notice that this is a Word document and do the text extraction at the same time that it's doing the upload and then index the resulting text. Um, and then you can kind of write your own things as well. So if, if you wanted to make it work from another language, you could wrap it all up and, and do that. So Tika app is a single runnable jar. Single jar, everything included in it. All the dependencies, everything you need to, to use. And it comes with a GUI mode and a CLI mode. The GUI mode is really good for demos and testing. Um, it's also quite good for giving to your manager if he wants to check if Tika supports a file format or not. You can just give him the jar, double click on it, drag and drop a file on and see what you get back. The command line mode has uh, a few common things like detect, metadata, and XML. And it also provides a way of interrogating Tika and finding out what MIME types are available, what passes are available. It's really quick to get going, but each time you run it, you have to start a new JVM. So if you want something simple, it's great. But if you're going to be calling this 20 times a second, firing up a new JVM every single time, it's not going to be ideal. Great for testing, great for infrequent use, not so good for uh, re really, um, really frequent calling. The Tika Facade class tries to be a very, very simple way to call Tika. Single class, org Apache Tika Tika, and it provides methods like detect 
file, detect byte array, detect string, pass the string file, pass the string input string, um, pass to reader and things like that. So just simple methods on it, give it what you've got, tell it what you want back. Um, it, but in order to work, you have to have all of the Tika jars on your class path and all of their dependencies and not have clashing versions of dependencies. So for example, Tika 1.6 depends on Apache POI 3.10. If your framework bundles a copy of Apache POI 2.5.1, as terrifyingly large numbers of them do, and you have both Apache POI jars on your class path, you'll get a clash. You won't be able to call the POI-based passes, but there's no easy way to find out from the Tika facade that the reason why you're not getting anything back from your Word documents is because there was an exception raised because the jars mismatched and the parser couldn't be loaded. So it's really simple to call, but you can't easily peek under the hood to work out why, why something's not working. So if it's a standalone application, you can just drop this in, drop in the jars, and away you go. If you've got a really complicated example uh, and really complicated big system, you might want to, to drop down to the other way so you get a bit more identification of what's going on. So alternatively, you can call the Tika classes directly. And what you'll probably want to do is get a Tika config object. That's your starting point. And that provides access to the detectors, to the parsers, uh, to all the mind magic and everything like that. And if you're going to do this, I would strongly suggest that you pass in all your inputs as a Tika input stream. You can get a Tika input stream from a file, from a URL, byte array, input stream, all that kind of thing. And the thing about the Tika input stream is it's, you can go forward, you can go back, you can get a file object from it, and it makes the passing a lot easier. Now, you still need all of the jars on your class path in order to be able to use this. It's no different. But the difference is that you can go to a default parser and say, what mime types do you support? Which parser classes have you loaded? And then you can enumerate through that in a unit test or a deployment script or something and go, hmm, I'm supposed to have 30 parsers. I have two parsers. Something clearly has gone wrong. This is not going to work. Uh, we have an OSGI bundle for those who like OSGI. The um, thing is that you need to put in both the Tika core jar and the Tika bundle jar. Um, Yuka, who's not here, wrote this and had a very good reason, which I don't understand because I don't know OSGI, why there has to be the two jars. But make sure that you load both and you activate both. And then once that's been done, you can either call the ticket facade or the classes directly. Um, if you look in the unit tests, you'll see an example of how to activate both the bundles and check it's all working. Um, if you're wondering why it's not working, the best advice I can give is look at the unit test, try and run the unit test. If the unit test runs, you're probably mostly there. Forked parser. By default, Tika runs in the same JVM as the rest of your program. So if the Tika or the library it depends on breaks, so does the rest of your JVM. Now, in a perfect world, that will never happen. The title of the talk was talking about big data environment. If 0.00001% of the files on the internet are broken, and you're indexing the internet, your JVM is going to break from time to time. Sometimes files will be broken in ways that trigger the parser to run out of memory. Sometimes they'll get into tight loops and, and run forever and things like that. So the bigger the data, the number of files you're, you're running, the more likely you are to, to hit this problem. So the, uh, the fault parser is kind of neat and kind of terrifying. It spits out one very, very small class, fires up a new JVM, connects to it over a socket, sends it all of the Tika jars and their dependencies in a serialized form, waits for it to come up, and then hands it over this socket data and gets back the response. So if the Tika parsing crashes, 
the other JVM dies, you can detect that, fire up a new one, skip that file. Other option for having things in a separate JVM is the JAXRS network server. Uh, it's powered by Apache CXF. You download the Tika server jar, run it, tell it what port you want. And then there are a number of different URLs and endpoints. And you can just put a file to it, put a file to the um, metadata URL, and you get back the metadata. Put a file to the detect URL, you get back the mime type. Uh, so if you're going to be calling Tika from a non-JVM environment, and you're going to be calling it a lot, I'd strongly suggest that you run it with the Tika network server, not the Tika CLI. Because with this one, you only start the JVM once. Tika CLI, you'll be starting it every time. And there's Solar Plugin, as I've mentioned. One thing to be aware of is that the Solar Plugin is written by the Solar community, not by the Tika community. So not everything that can be done in Tika can be done in the Solar Plugin. And if you come and ask the Tika community for help using the Solar Plugin, we'll normally look a bit blankly at you. Um, but it works. It's great. But it's interesting that the Elasticsearch community explicitly chose not to have something like this. They instead provide examples on their website of how to write your own code that will call Tika and then give the resulting thing to Elasticsearch. Because they've decided that for them, they're not happy with the level of integration and putting Tika at that point. But if, if you're working with Solar and you just want to have your Word documents indexed and you don't have any special requirements, you can just drop in the appropriate Solar Tika jar for it, and away you go. So, I've got a few minutes left. So how do we, um, how do we make Tika work at scale? So, at scale, you're going to have a lot of junk data and you're going to have a lot of those very, very, very rare edge cases happening often. 1% of a lot is still a lot. So you're bound to have some files which will be misdetected. You're bound to have some that will be misidentified. You're bound to have some files that will be corrupted enough to mess things up. So as with most big data things, plan for failures. You are going to get them. You're also going to have a lot of really unusual types. You're going to come across files that are corrupted beyond recognition that you're not going to be able to identify. And you're going to come across files that are perfectly fine, perfectly uncorrupted, just not, not added into Tika. Um, so you're probably going to want to add support for your common, uncommon file types in Tika. But to start with, you're not going to know what your common, uncommon file types are. So it's worth having some logging that goes somewhere into your big data system about the things that you couldn't cope with. Um, you probably want to log the file name, even though that's not always going to be correct. It's still a hint. And it's probably also worth logging maybe hex encoded the first 20 characters of the file, because that will be enough to get a lot of the um, the my magics. If you're then looking for the common ones, don't match exactly on that first 20 characters. Because if the first 20 characters are four bytes of magic number followed by 12 bytes of the file length, that's going to be different every time. But those four, first four bytes will be the same. So you might need to do some heuristic matching to then work out what are the common magics that you're going to be interested in to add support for them. So don't try and fix every format, but use your big data cluster, which already has ways of storing lots of data. Use the, use the support that's already in that to store information about the things that don't work, and then come back later on and go and implement the, the bits that you missed. And then, as I've mentioned already, plan for failure. You are going to get files which out of memory. You are going to have files that cause infinite loops, sometimes because they're corrupted, Sometimes because it's an edge case in a library. Sometimes it's just something stupid in a library that no one's really noticed before. Um, something that maybe um, causes a 100K file to take three seconds, not one second, might, might kind of not be noticed by that library. 
But when you've then got a 100 megabyte file and it's taking it half an hour, then that's going to become more obvious to you. Um, so do plan for your, your JVM to crash from time to time. And if a file fails once, it's probably going to fail again. I know that people who are doing Hadoop assume that if a file fails, that could be because the machine itself is broken and you need to rerun that on a different machine in the cluster. If it's the parsing, there's a reasonable chance that if it fails once, it's going to fail somewhere else again. And you don't want to just keep wiping out your JVM on every single job node in your cluster because you keep giving the same problem file to all of them and the JVM keeps crashing. So you may need to take a slightly different approach in terms of retries and failures. Um, consider using the forked parser so that at least if the file breaks, it doesn't wipe out your whole job node. Consider using the um, Tika server. Um, you know, you can fire up a Tika server on each job node and then it's there and running. Or if the detection or the text extraction is a rare thing, you could maybe have a small pool of Tika servers that you call out to. But make sure that you've sized that appropriately because you don't want to have 100 Hadoop job nodes sat blocking, waiting for your one single Tika server instance to do all the detection and, and give the metadata back. Um, and if you can, if there's a problem that keeps coming up and you can share the file, report a bug to the Tika project, include the file, include the stack trace, all that sort of thing. Um, saying, sometimes some of my documents don't work, not, not really going to get you very far. But if you can say, I only found this same kind of problem that comes up and it comes up almost always on documents from my managing director that I can't share, but I've seen exactly the same stack trace from this file here from archive.org, that's probably good enough. We can go and get that public document and work from that. So, a couple of other projects before we finish that you might want to look at. Fatika, it's worth having a look at Nutch, which uses Tika internally to go and do the indexing and the crawling and so on. NE23 uh, does something a bit similar to Tika, but for um, triples and, and RDF. OpenNLP gets to use all, all sorts of nice text processing things. Any others that people would suggest that you should be aware of? No. Nope. And a few external projects. Um, there is. Yep. Um, there is a, a project out there that I've come across that's trying to do a hardened version of Tika, where they do some extra error handling and, and, and catching. Um, if you have a look on the mailing list, you'll find a reference to that. Could be worth um, checking. Generally, we try and merge in some of the fixes they do, but they're doing a little bit more paranoid things. Uh, the encoding detection and language detection in Tika is quite good, but it's not perfect. Um, the Google Chrome Compact Language Detector is available. You may want to look at using that if you're mostly interested in, in detecting encodings and, and things around text files. And um, Mozilla's LibCharset Detector is also available. I believe there's a Java port of the CLD, but there's not of the Mozilla one. Uh, also on the Java side, there's ICU for J. Tika embeds a cut down version of ICU for J for some of its detection, but for some things you might want to go and have a look at the full-blown ICU for J if you're really caring about the encoding detection and things like that. Any, any other Tika-related things to mention that anyone's come across? Any final questions in the two minutes we've got? Um, do you want to run over with the mic so it gets recorded? Can we get some volume on the mic? Have you turned it on? Might be a battery issue. Yes. Uh, I'll yell out. Uh, just wondering from a performance perspective, if I want, want to do detection but on streaming data where I didn't have the entire document initially in memory, is Tika able to kind of end quickly and kind of abort quickly if it identifies something at the beginning of the file and then it's a magic line numbers? Or does it have to always read the entire? 
The mime magic, I believe, can only work on the first four or eight kilobytes. I can't remember which. But Tika only looks at that first bit. Um, if it detects that it's a container format from the mime magic, and you're running with the full set of jars and all the detectors, it will then give that whole file to the container-specific detector, which will then peek inside and look at it. So if all you're interested in is detection based on the mime magic, you can just get the first 4K or first 8K, pass that to the mime magic detector, and it will give you its best guess of what that is. And that will be nice and quick. I think we've got time for one more. So is uh, Tika only able to extract a text only? Say, if you have a PDF file with like, a well-formatted table and columns, will that be able to extract the column structure? Um, so PDF is complicated. But for a Word document, if you, re if you get back the structure, the XHTML, it will include the table structure and it will have that as XHTML, table, columns, rows, things like that. PDF is complicated because it looks to you like a table, but it could actually be a block of text, 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 a block of text. So PDF box has algorithms that try to detect based on where the text is, which may actually be written one character at a time in different streams. And then if PDF box can detect that it's a table, then Tika can output it as a table. Some PDFs will come through beautifully. Some of them will not because they've done really weird things. So often, but not always, the structured XHTML will tell you what it's about. I think out of time. But if you want to know more, come and find us in the Tika Hackathon room this afternoon.